on this edition of Independent Sources, musical healing, using songs to soothe veterans traumatized by war, and after school, but not an afterthought. South Bronx students use photography and journalism to highlight their undeserved community. Independent Sources, your window to the city's ethnic and immigrant communities. Here's your host, Gary Pierre-Pierre. The Institute for Music and Neurological Function in Mount Vernon is using music to help veterans suffering with post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, and traumatic brain injuries. The U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs says that the PTSD rate among soldiers varies depending on the war in which they served. They estimate that about 12% of Gulf War vets suffer from PTSD, while nearly 30% of Vietnam vets suffer with the disorder. It's expected that the large community of veterans in the Bronx and Westchester will benefit from this music therapy program on a weekly basis. We hear about how instrumental the healing music program has been in helping some participants in this piece produced by Mariev Ami. <laughs> In the beginning when we started the group, it was a, a true music therapy group. It had a lot of therapy goals, uh, working on self-regulation, emotional resiliency, trust of other people, looking at bonds amongst the uh, group members and things like that. But it's really, at this point, a way of supporting their self-expression, their creativity, and giving them a, a, a purpose to, to get out every day and to be part of the community. I was a music therapy recipient and a, a patient receiving care in music therapy when I became an amputee back in 2001. I was a, a victim of arson and um, I was one of the original facilitators of this program along with um, a couple of um, licensed music therapists. And um, I definitely understand that the readjustment part of, you know, trying to get a grip on the world and how it's set up again after the setback of, you know, like severe trauma or um, you can refer to it as like sort of a, a displacement, like you're sort of removed, so you're trying to get back in. Blame your kiss, as sweet as a kiss can be. I was diagnosed with uh, PTSD, just uh, having a hard time emotionally, mentally. Uh, I was, I had, I had been traumatized a couple of times by different things, a couple of times. And uh, I said, uh, I'm, I'm not going to continue with this. There's no reason for me to continue to live because I have no reason to, and I want out. I was really sad. I had nothing, and the music just ignited something, and the people. For so many people who have experienced traumatic um, events in their life, uh, there's often a real detachment between their feelings or their ability to, to really be in touch with their feelings. And you can't heal or you can't recover if you don't know what it is that's blocking you. And so many times those emotions that are inherently expressed in the music can be used as a catalyst for discussion and bringing those personal feelings up to the surface. When you sing, if you listen to the words, the words have meanings. The words will connect you with yourself or with somebody else outside yourself. A person with PTSD is sort of bombarded by a lot of different thoughts and intrusions about their safety and about um, 
their belonging. And um, it can cause some people severe anxiety and things like that. When you're constantly reminded or constantly asking yourself, am I safe? So it becomes something that's sort of ringing in the back of your head, you know, am I safe? Is this okay? Am I in a, a safe place? You know, how can I be sure? Let me make sure. Or just a lot of avoidance of different things. I think it's the best, the best way to find out if there's something wrong with you is admit you have a problem. Face the idea that you're not there anymore. That was in the past. So long as you know that, when you hear a firecracker, 4th of July, it's going to bring it back. But you know what it is, you know how to deal with it. You might not be cured, never, but you always can always treat it and you can always stay active. You don't let it beat you, you beat it. See, and that's my, that's my, and music helped me to fight it, I know this. I see cloud blue. We saw memory improvements, we saw um, attention improvements, control over emotional regulation, which is big, uh, being more tolerant of others, which is big. So all of those kinds of gradual, really slow little steps of improvement that over time became major steps of recovery. I just smile and people don't even know that uh, what I'm smiling about. It's just I feel good when I do something correct and I feel like it's right, you know? And so that helps, that helps you a lot, you know? Even if somebody misses a session, the other participants will call them up to see how they're doing. It's that kind of, it's grown into that kind of support system. Uh, for them to feel that they have a, a means to express themselves, that they have a means to be creative, um, a means to give back, because we do do a performance at the end of the year. We're hoping to do one for the holidays, gives them motivation. All I can think now is that life is worth living sometimes. You just have to find the right connection. Like right now, I'm not connected with my family at all. But there's, a, there's, a, there's an ember there in my heart for myself and other people. Stay tuned. When we come back, an after-school program that's highlighting immigrant life in the South Bronx. Thanks for staying tuned. Some middle and high school students in the South Bronx are getting the chance to zoom in on their undeserved community through a free after-school journalism and photography program called the Bronx Junior Photo League. The league is just one of the offerings of the nonprofit gallery and educational space called the Bronx Documentary Center. Joining me in studio to talk about the Junior Photo League are the center's founder and director, Mike Camber, and league member, Tony Baizan. Welcome. Thank you for having us. I'd like to start our conversation by taking a look at part of the piece you produced for the program, Tony. Let's roll in. Uh, Ruth Mendez, edad 35 años. Yo nací en México, yo vine a 18 años para acá. Um, he trabajado aquí como inmigrante. Siempre trabajé con mis flores. Toda la vida he trabajado desde que llegué por 14 años en esto. Al no tener las posibilidades de poder estudiar en mi país, por las pocas oportunidades que en ese momento se brindaban, yo llego a este país con la ilusión de, ya no de estudiar, sino de hacer como un porvenir aquí, de tener alguna otra oportunidad diferente. En el caso mío, cuando te digo, cuando yo llego sin ningún idioma, sin ningún nada, eh, sin documentos, y no puedes como, como que en ese momento tú no sabes. Y entonces te meten como ciertos miedos, como ciertos temores, como tú no puedes ir a pedir trabajo o no puedes hacer esto. Entonces, como tú dijiste, uno se busca su propio trabajo. En este caso yo me busqué mi propio trabajo. Eh, empecé a vender flores en, en las calles y de ahí empecé a construir un poquito mi, lo, que es, lo que es ahora un pequeño negocio. Tony, real smart piece. So talk to us about the, the process, the project. How did this story come about? Why did you choose this story to tell? Well, uh, I knew Ruth through my mom. Uh, both don't really have, I guess, what I would call a normal nine to five job. Mm -hmm. My mom makes food in the morning and she sells it to Ruth, who works at the truck in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes she'll get paid with money and other times she'll get paid with flowers. Um, and, and sometimes when I, I, I wouldn't go to school, I, I 
would deliver the food for my mom. Um, and that's how I got to slowly, I guess, know and okay. um, photograph Ruth. Okay. So uh, how long have you been with the center? It's been like, a, uh, I think almost a year now. A year. And when you started, uh, did you have any photo experience or you just tell us a little bit more? No, I, I started like three or four years ago at ICP at the Point. Okay. Another, um, I guess, free photography class by like the International Center of Photography. Okay. They take their teen academy classes and bring them to the Point uh, Community Center in Hunts Point. Okay. And that's not too far from where I live. And my brother went there because his friend went there. And I went there because my brother and I wanted to do something with him. And then we took separate classes. And so I, I kept trying to find a reason to photograph. Okay. So, Mike, is, is Tony typical of, of, of the, the students you have there at the center? Um, I'd say maybe he's a little above average. <laughs> he's, he's, he's a great photographer. Uh, he's, uh, I'd say he's, he's pretty much obsessed with it. You know, a lot of our, our photographers, um, they love photography, but they're thinking about different careers. Okay. Tony's really focused on photojournalism. I mean, he really wants to be. You'll, you'll come in on a Sunday, you'll find him in the library going through the books, and, you know, he's really dedicated to it. He's out in his free time shooting, um, working on personal projects. He's just kind of absorbing as much photography as you can get. Now, you've uh, had a distinguished career overseas in Africa and the Middle East. And so why was it important for you to come back home and start this program? I felt like um, what I was seeing were, were a lot of journalism schools that cost 50000 a year, $60,000 a year. It's Not like, CUNYs. Not CUNYs, <laughs> not CUNYs. <laughs> <laughs> but a, a lot of them are very expensive, sure. uh, and myself, I didn't go to college. I, I wasn't able to, um, couldn't afford kind of a formal education. And um, so with my friend Tim Hetherington, we kind of dreamed up this idea that we could have a, a free nonprofit place. I'd lived in the Bronx for years. My family was from the Bronx. It seemed like the place to do it. Um, and Tim, Tim was killed in Libya in 2011. And so we kind of started the program in his memory, myself and a bunch of volunteers. And uh, why, is it important to you that uh, people from a certain neighborhood are able to tell their stories? It Absolutely, because, you know, I, I, worked in a, I worked for most of the major news organizations in, in, in the United States. And um, it, it, unfortunately, it was a very elite experience. You know, it was people who had gone to only the best universities and... and um, I felt like it wasn't very democratic in a certain way, and I felt like we need a level playing field. You know, we've got brilliant, brilliant young people, um, and especially from the community. You know, if there's so much reporting about the Bronx that's done sure. by people not from the Bronx, so how can we change that? So, Tony, you had a chance to tell your story. How important was it for you? Because you mentioned that your mom is, is, is partnering with the, the lady you profile in here. Uh, is, is that something that's very uh, special or important to you to tell your story? Originally, I was going to do the piece on my mom, uh, and then I, I've always kind of had difficulty photographing my mom. Why? Sometimes she, she just doesn't let me. Uh, she doesn't let any of us. My two brothers are also photographers, and we always get yelled at. Um, and I saw so much of Ruth. Uh, I, I saw so much of my mom in Ruth, okay. um, who also has three kids of her own and is also doesn't have an official job and is still working hard for her kids. And I, I wanted to kind of photograph some of the similarities and moments that could have happened between my mom uh, and Ruth with her kids. Mm -hmm. and, and so from a technical standpoint, what have you learned since you've been at the center? I, I guess I've learned how to kind of create a very concise story. Before I had ICP at the point, my prints were kind of scattered and mm -hmm. I, I'd kind of wait in the last minute until kind of write an artist statement and piece together um, a pe like a story that wasn't always um, very solid and kind of honest. What do you What do you want to do when you grow up? Well, my mom always asks me that every morning. Um, <laughs> for different reasons, though. Yeah, <laughs> and I always tell her that I want to be a, a photojournalist for the New York Times. Oh, okay. Well, you have a good uh, mentor here who can help you. So, to, uh, Mike, talk to us about. It. I know these things cost money. Uh, do you have support from foundations? How do you get keep this going? We write grants almost every day. Yeah, you know, we're constantly writing grants. Um, we get some money from um, New York State, from New York City, from the city, a little bit of money from the city council, um, the Ford Foundation. We're just constantly, co maybe every week we're writing grants, literally, um, trying to keep the place going. And, um, you know, we, we, we slowly have grown. You know, we started uh, our after school program five years ago. We had seven kids, and we now have almost uh, 60 kids. 
So it's really grown tremendously. Um, we're going five days. You know, we started one day a week. Now we're five days a week. You know, so it's 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 uh, it, it's a struggle. But you know, the 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 neighborhood is full of kids and. There's just a lot of talent. It's really most of the other photographers who come and help are they volunteers or do you do you pay them to to help out? We have a lot of volunteers. You know, we have, we we have a growing staff, a lot of part-time teachers, um, but um, we also have a lot of volunteers that um, you know they keep the place open on the weekend and um, it helps to keep our costs down. You know, we, we don't have we don't have a big budget, but it, if you've got a, a dedicated group of volunteers, you can do a lot. How, how, when did you start? When did you start the program? 2011. We started in 2011, so it's it's uh, almost seven years now. And so far, uh, Tony, where else do you want to take your skill? What else do you think you need to learn to as you grow? I guess I was just going to stay with the BDC, I guess, for as long as I could, um, doing volunteer work, teaching if I could, um, using their darkroom and library. Um, I'm not sure what else I can learn. I'm sure there's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> We've got um, Todd Heisler, who's a, a Pulitzer Prize winner from the New York Times, is um, mentoring Tony. So, so you have one-on-one -on -one mentor uh, with, yeah. with, with a lot of yeah. the... Uh, we find that really helps to, to put them with a, a, a top professional photographer, meet with them. Um, Tony, how, how often does he meet with you, Todd? I think right now he's away, but I, I try to kind of talk to him every week or two. Right. And he looks at your he looks at your work and reviews what you've been doing and offers ideas. He I think right now he's down covering the killings in Texas, unfortunately. Okay. Okay. I, I saw some work. So uh, do these kids do they have their own equipment? How, how, do they use smartphones or we, how, how does that work? We provide them with cameras. Okay. Yeah, we provide them with cameras, um, both um, digital and analog. We still do a lot. Oh, of okay, stuff. film. Okay. Tony shoots a lot of film. Why, why do you like films? Interesting. Well, that's kind of what I started with, and okay. what I'm more comfortable with. Um, I know how to shoot digital. I know how to shoot film. Um, film just takes a lot longer. Um, is it? Do you find it much more journalistic? I guess I just like I get using my hands to make something. Okay. Mike Camber, Tony Bizan, thanks for coming in to talk to us about the Bronx Junior Photo League. To learn more about what they're doing at the Documentary Center, you can visit the website bronxdoc.org. Still to come on the show, the Smithsonian's efforts to be more inclusive when telling this country's art history. Finally from us, founded by an act of Congress in 1846, the Smithsonian has since become a complex of 19 museums, the National Zoo, and nine research facilities. It's the central repository of our nation's history, culture, and art. The museum recently launched an initiative to focus on people of color. The latest drive is to highlight Latinos, their history, culture, and art. Today, we'll feature the first in a two-part series looking at the innovations currently underway at two of the Smithsonian's museums, the Smithsonian American Art Museum and the National Portrait Gallery. Judith Escalona produced this report about E. Carmen Ramos and her plans for the Smithsonian American Art Museum. I think the field of Latino art has often been excluded from the narrative of American art. And one of the things that we can do at the Smithsonian American Art Museum through our pioneering uh, collection of Latino art is to really change that narrative. So a lot of my focus has been on building the collection, creating a context to interpret it, uh, either in our permanent collection galleries or through uh, exhibitions. Uh, and in the coming years, I'd really like us to expand the frames in which we present Latino art. Uh, I'd like to see more ex solo exhibitions of works by Latino artists, uh, mid-career surveys. I'd like to see more uh, major exhibitions that present the work of Latino artists with their colleagues across ethnic, racial uh, categories. The first exhibition that I organized here at the Smithsonian American Art Museum 
was a major exhibition titled Our America, the Latino Presence in American Art. The show presented works from our uh, pioneering collection of Latino art. It attempted to present and to sort of explore the links between uh, Latino art and the history of American art from which it had been excluded. My recent exhibition, uh, Down These Mean Streets, Community and Place in Urban Photography, also sort of exclusively looks at the work of Latino artists within a frame of a larger event or moment in uh, American culture and history, and that was uh, the urban crisis. And I think both of these exhibitions are really trying to elucidate uh, and to present the perspectives of uh, Latino artists. One of the great things about working at the Smithsonian American Art Museum is that in our building, we have a sister organization, the National Portrait Gallery. I've been very fortunate to have a wonderful colleague, Taina Garagol, who is a curator of Latino art and history at uh, the National Portrait Gallery. And we realized that we were working on uh, projects that were very interrelated, that were focusing on the work of Latino artists working in, uh, in New York City during the 60s and 70s, and really the sort of transformations that were taking place in New York uh, around that time. So we decided to come together and to produce uh, a film program. If you're feeling all right and you think you're on Somebody let me know Will everybody in the place put a whistle in your face Scream it out and say no Hey You don't stop I like the rhythm that makes your finger pop I said a hip hop but thanks a lot Seven years of voluntary exile Far from familiar faces and landscapes Sometimes, when you love somebody, you can overlook a lot of things that you normally wouldn't. And it was uh, a wonderful experience. I think we reached a great audience. So I think that we are in a really transformative moment um, at the Smithsonian and really um, for our, our nation, really, in thinking about uh, Latino culture and history, not as a sort of sidebar, you know, to American history and culture, but really as an integral part of it. Uh, I see that the history, and, and really firmly believe that the history of American art is incomplete without the work of Latino artists. Dr. Ramos is currently curating an exhibit called Tamayo, the New York Years. It features the work of Mexican painter Rufino Tamayo, who lived in New York City in the late 1920s and 30s. Tamayo will run through March 2018. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. Till next time, be independent-minded.